This morning's keynote, the reason we're all here, um, we've had a few technical issues with this too. Um, John O'Bacon is a leading community and collaboration speaker, author, and podcaster. He is the founder of John O'Bacon Consulting and provides community strategy and execution, workflow, and other services. He previously served as director of community at GitHub, Canonical, XPRIZE, and Open Advantage. Now, the, the problems we've had is that John is stuck in a hotel with sketchy Wi-Fi, so he'll be, um, play, we'll be playing a pre-recorded <laughs> session of his talk. However, yeah. with luck, we have him here now to um, just say hi, and um, we'll be going on to your keynote shortly, which is titled The Conflict and Burnout Survival Guide, Handling When Things Go Wrong. How are you doing this morning, John? Or Pretty good. I was, I was really tempted to just kind of like do this, kind of like... <laughs> Just pretend my mic's not working just to screw with you all, but uh, that would be mean. That's a, uh, oh, <laughs> with this morning, wouldn't feel it. Yeah. All right, so we might we'd, uh, start the video now if we can, and we'll come back um, in, you know, 40-ish, 45 minutes. Looking forward to it. Thanks a lot. Hello, my friends, and thank you for joining me today for my session here at LCA. I'm so stoked to be here. LCA is one of my favorite conferences on the planet. Um, I've had the good fortune to go to two of them in person. And of course, here we are virtually. Um, but thank you so much to the LCA team for inviting me to come and do a keynote. They're such a wonderful team and they really work hard to put on a great event. So make sure you give them all a big fist bump um, as you go through the rest of the event. All right. Now. Uh, if you're wondering who on earth I am, my name is John Bacon. I've been around open source since 1998. I used to lead community for the Ubuntu project uh, when I was at Canonical, and I've also led community for GitHub and XPRIZE. And these days I'm a consultant. I work with lots and lots of different uh, companies to help them build really engaging and productive communities. Okay, now when the LCA team reached out and they said, what do you want to speak about? Um, I wanted to talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and that is how to deal with the underbelly of human collaboration, right? How to deal with conflict resolution, how to deal with um, burnout and crises, okay? So what I'm going to be covering in today's session are some really practical things that you can put into practice when you have to deal with a crisis, when you have to deal with conflict resolution, or when you or somebody else may be burning out. So let's dig right in. All right, now before I go on, I want to make something very, very clear, okay? Because I'm going to be touching on some elements of human psychology, especially when I talk about burnout a little bit later on. And I want to make it very clear that I am not a doctor, okay? Uh, don't take advice on, on, on health matters and mental health matters from a dude on the internet, okay? Go and talk to a medical professional if you do need to speak to them. Um, some elements of burnout can get kind of dangerous and um, it, there's no shame, there's no embarrassment in going and talking to, your, talking to your doctor and saying, I need some help, I need some guidance, all right? So I just wanted to get that caveat out there. Now, when we think about these more challenging elements of communities, um, um, I like to think of it as kind of the pyramid of suck, <laughs> is what I'd probably call it. I just named it there on the spot. Um, and I break it down into three layers, and the, the, the size of each layer reflects how much it tends to impact us, right? So at the top of the pyramid, we've got crisis management. That's when something disastrous happens, maybe downtime, or there's a big security vulnerability, or there's a, a big interpersonal issue inside of a community. Um, it doesn't happen all that often, but it can be terrifying when it does happen. The middle layer is conflict resolution. This is when we, uh, when two people don't get on, when there's personality conflicts or differences in opinion or creative disagreements. Um, that definitely impacts more people. But then what impacts a lot more people is stress and burnout. In fact, stress and burnout will impact everybody at some point. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, okay? So I'm gonna go through each of these th three different layers and provide some really practical recommendations as I go through it, okay? One thing I wanna make very clear is that this session, session that you're watching right now as I'm talking to you is pre-recorded just so we can avoid any networking issues because uh, while this event is on, I at the last minute had to make a trip um, to Tahoe and the, there's all kinds of challenges. We're staying in a hotel with internet, uh, you know, the quality of, it, of your bandwidth in a hotel and all kinds of things. So I'm recording this bit, but when I finish my session, uh, my presentation here, I am gonna be available online to answer your questions, all right? So make sure you get your questions in and I'll try and answer them as we're going through it, okay? So as I'm going through the session, get your questions in and I will answer them in the chat, all right? All right, let's get back to it. So let's start out with, with uh, crisis management. So how do we deal with a crisis? So let's assume for the sake of argument that you're, you've got an open source project and let's say there's a big security vulnerability, a log4j type situation. How do you deal with that? Well, this can be terrifying. When these moments happen, 
They're, you know, all eyes are on you and it can be embarrassing and it can cause all kinds of anxiety. A lot of people, when, when, when this happens, they tend to just kind of clam up and they don't know how to deal with it, okay? The first thing we need to do when we deal with any kind of crisis is to be humble, okay? Is to accept that we don't have all the answers, human beings are fallible, and what we need to do is to figure out what's going on and to rectify it as quickly and as easily as possible, okay? All too often what happens when a crisis goes down is that, um, is that let's say a company, a crisis impacts a company, what they do is they lock off all forms of communication, they tell their PR team to tell journalists to go away, they try to rectify the crisis and then they publish some kind of groveling apology on their blog afterwards. And it's not a particularly great way of managing things. A great way of managing things was, was epitomized by GitLab. So one thing that happened is a number of years ago, GitLab, they had an issue where one of their engineers fat fingered an update and basically um, their service went down and they went through multiple backups to try and rectify it. And all the backups were failing. It was a real issue. Instead of GitLab battening down the hatches, what they did instead was they kickstarted a, a live Google Doc um, where they were debugging what was going on. They had a live YouTube stream. They included their community in trying to rectify and resolve the situation, especially when they were trying to figure out what was going on. And it was incredibly refreshing. And what it actually resulted in was hashtags on Twitter where people were like, hugs for GitLab, because it was so nice that they were inclusive in how, in how they were dealing with this, okay? Awesome, and credit where credit's due to GitLab. So when you're thinking about managing a crisis situation, these are the steps I'd recommend you go through. And hopefully you don't have to do this very often. You hopefully you can avoid these kinds of crises. But the first step is to stop the rot, okay? And that is if there's something going on, if there's, let's say you've, you've got a, um, a piece of software in, in a project that's, uh, let's say in a, in, a, in a deployment that isn't working, or let's say there's a module in, in an open source project that's having some issues, the first thing you need to do is to try and stop it as much as possible. Now, this is gonna vary in different situations. If there's a security vulnerability, you know, you can't roll that security vulnerability out immediately, right? But if you've got a problem with a piece of infrastructure that's, that's you know, erroring, for example, taking that infrastructure down to fix it is a good way of stopping the rot, okay? Uh, the second thing you're going to want to then do is to investigate. And again, where possible and where appropriate, try and include your community, try and include your customers in this, right? One thing I always like to say in these kinds of situations when I've advised clients on this is just be vulnerable, right? Tell them like, look, we're human beings, right? Human beings make mistakes. Our, our first and um, 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 most important priority right now is just to understand what's going on. We're not interested in assigning blame or throwing shame at people. We just want to figure out what's going on, right? So we investigate what's happening. Um, and, and one of the best things you can do is to create like a shared channel, like an incident response channel on something like Slack or an IRC where you can start pooling some of this information. The third step then is to identify some short-term solutions, okay? Now, Again, one thing that can happen when, the, when a crisis kind of goes down is that people can um, uh, often like switch everything off and shut everything down and then go away and come up with a much longer term kind of resolution to it. But sometimes the first thing you need to do is to acknowledge it and just say, we're really sorry, something's happening. We're not entirely sure what's happening right now. You can go here to this Google Doc, which we've opened up and you can see updates as it's going on. And then as you start figuring out what's happening, what's causing this crisis, then you can start putting in place some solutions, some, some short-term solutions that can rectify it, okay? But as you're doing this, you're continuing to investigate, all right? Then what happens is once you've kind of put in place some of those solutions and the crisis has been somewhat mitigated, the best thing you can do now is to not stop there, is not say, okay, now we've got things up and running. Like GitLab didn't just, you know, get their service back online and that was it. What they did is they continued evaluating what happened and they put in place measures and workflows uh, to make sure that it didn't happen again in the future. And in fact, it's not happened again since then, okay? So this is kind of the cherry on top is that as you're incorporating and including your audience in ex trying to figure out what's going on, the investigating it and then and then you present a solution to rectify the issue with the, with the, with the crisis, then what you do is you, you, you continue and say, okay, well, that went down, that sucked, now we've put in place these three or four different things that will hopefully rectify this from, or prevent this from happening again in the future, okay? And then what you do is further down the line, maybe three or four months down the line, is you review it and you continue to refine it, okay? So that's the summary of how I would recommend you, rec you, you, you deal with a crisis. Stop the rot, 
investigate what's going on, okay? Provide some short-term solutions uh, to just get things back up and running, provide some long-term solutions as a preventative measure, and then regularly review and refine it. All right, makes sense? Thumbs up? Yep, okay, great. Let's now move on to our second part of, uh, of the, the Triangle of Suck. I think I'm gonna stick with this name, the Triangle of Suck, I like that. Um, all right, oh, I'm getting distracted now. I'm thinking, should I register a domain? Should I? Someone already right now is probably registering triangleofsuck.com. It probably already exists. I actually don't go to that website. It's probably gonna be something terrible. All right, so let's now talk about conflict resolution. Now, this is, again, this is something that is kind of inevitable. This is going to happen um, in your community or in your project, in your family, in your business at some point, okay? And the question that I always have when you kind of come into a, um, a conflict uh, scenario, and I always ask myself this uh, privately, is why can't we all just get along, right? Like, why is it that this has occurred in the first place? We're going to talk in a second about um, how we rectify and resolve a conflict scenario. But what are the causes of these people kind of not getting on and there being this, this, this fire and flame between them? And this can be conflict between two people. It could be conflict between a couple of groups, multiple people. Um, there's all kinds of forms in which, in which conflict can, can, can manifest, okay? But let's walk through some of the typical reasons why conflicts can occur, all right? The first one is unclear expectations. And that is that, okay, I was expecting you to do this thing and you were expecting me to do this thing and then something completely different happened. And then there's frustration there. And we see this all of the time. This is the most common cause of conflict is unclear expectations. Is that, um, you know, let's say one person was expecting this other person to work on a project and they didn't actually work on it. And then, you know, the work didn't get done and that can cause some underlying issues. What often happens with conflict is, let's say somebody's got unclear expectations about, you know, what was actually gonna be done by somebody. What can often happen is that you get frustrated by that and then you kind of think, ah, oh, I'm not gonna make a big deal of this and you bury it down, okay? Um, and then if this keeps happening over and over again, then it all comes up and it, and it manifests in a conflict scenario. I'll provide a stupid little example of what I'm talking about here. Um, when I was in one of my previous bands, I play in a, a metal band called Baron Carter. You should go and check us out on Spotify or wherever. Um, but I, I, I used to play in a band called uh, Seraphidium when I lived in the UK. And um, I used to go and pick our guitarist up and then drop him off uh, after band practice. And he never said thanks to me. And it used to bug me, but I, I was like, don't be pathetic. Like, why would you say that to him? And it never... It, I never mentioned it, but every time he didn't say thanks, it bugged me and bugged me and bugged me and bugged me. And then eventually I just, com I completely ranted at him. And he was just like, dude, why didn't you say something? I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I didn't realize, okay? That's what happens all the time in conflict, all right? So unclear expectations. Now, another cause of, of uh, conflict can, can be communication issues. It, of course, in communities, we have people coming from many different parts of the world. Um, um, and, you know, and different levels of experience with, with communication. So people are talking across different languages, people come from different backgrounds, even different ages, right? Like even, even just here in the, in the US, right? There's, it's kind of well known, it's a bit of a stereotype, but I think it's actually true that people on the East Coast are much blunter, uh, are much more blunt and direct than people on the West Coast, right? Um, I've noticed as another generalization, that, and this is one of the things I love, actually, is I've worked with a bunch of Israeli companies. One of the things I love about working with Israelis is Israeli, Israelis are really direct. Like, there's no screwing around. You just kind of get on with things, right? But I've worked with various Californian companies where sometimes beat, people beat around the bush a little bit more. So these communication issues are pretty normal, okay? And sometimes people don't like how they communicate with each other. Like, some, somebody might not like somebody being pretty blunt or somebody may feel that somebody's not being blunt enough. This can cause conflict, all right? Another issue can be uncertainty. Uh, and anxiety is especially an element of this. You know, if you're working on a project, you're not sure if it's gonna work, or uh, if, if you've made a decision in an open source project uh, to go down a particular architectural path, and you're not sure if this is the right choice, that can cause nerves and anxiety, and sometimes people can worry about how that's gonna reflect on them as well. Another, another issue that can impact um, uh, uh, conflict is power imbalances. 
every room you walk into, there's some kind of power imbalance, right? So classic example would be a job interview. If you go for an interview at a job, person sitting on the other side of the desk who, who you want the job, who's potentially gonna offer you the job, they've got the power in the room, right? That's how the interview dynamic tends to work. But there's power everywhere. There's power at this conference between the people who run the conference and the people who are attending the conference. There's power between the fact that I'm the keynote speaker and I'm speaking to you and you're the attendees. I mean, frankly, there is no actual power with that. <laughs> but there's a perceived power. Oh, the keynote, that person knows what they're talking about. They have influence in our community and things like that. So these power imbalances are everywhere. And when people feel like the imbalance isn't fair, then that again can cause conflict. Another issue, and I already kind of covered this, is culture. You know, people come from different parts of the world. Much as we live in a pretty homogenized internet, we all come from different backgrounds. Like I, I was born in the north of England. And when I moved to the south of England, when I was 11 years old, it was a totally different culture, right? Um, and it was like 200 miles apart, okay? And, just in, and then when you think about people who live in different parts of the world, you know, the Middle East or Asia Pacific or Europe or America, or Africa or wherever, we all come from different cultural backgrounds, different heritages, different norms. All of these things can cause issues, okay? So how do we go about resolving this? Like what, what's the best thing that we can do to resolve conflict? Well, the first thing that I would recommend you do, and this is, this is the job for you, is to be a facilitator. Every conflict situation needs somebody who's gonna be able to say, okay, I'm here to try and rectify and resolve what's going on here. I wanna try and find a solution to this, okay? The challenge with conflict scenarios is that people are often looking for somebody to say that either side is right. And that's not what the solution is. The solution isn't about who's right and who's not right. That's how children solve problems, okay? The way in which we solve problems is by finding solutions. And in almost all, all conflict scenarios that I've ever, been invo I've ever been involved in, and I've been involved in hundreds of them as a facilitator, no, no single side of the conflict equation is ever 100% right. There is always levels of gray in between them. So your role as a facilitator is to build trust in both sides. Now, to be a facilitator, there has to be a perception that you're gonna be objective, okay? If, you know, if there is gonna be a conflict situation between person A and person B, and you are the spouse of person A, then you're clearly biased. There's a conflict of interest, okay? So you can only be a facilitator in situations where you, um, you can be objective. And the first thing you're gonna to wanna to say to those folks when you become that facilitator is I'm not gonna play favorites here. My goal here is to understand what's going on, find the causes of this conflict and find solutions so we can get back to living our lives, okay? The second step is to understand the issues in the people. Now this is really important, okay? Our natural human inclination is to jump to conclusions, is to think, I know that person and I could see why they did that. Or I know this other person and they're a decent person and I can't imagine that they would do the things they're being accused of, right? We have to throw that away. We have to look at the evidence. You've got to be like a, a jury or like a judge here and understand the issues. The first thing I'd recommend you do here is you get on a call with each of the individual parties. And again, conflict can be two different people. It can be two different groups. It can be three or four different people or groups. Get on a call with each of them. It's got to be a phone call. It can't be on Slack or email or IRC or anything like that. You've got to get on a call. And the reason why is that when you can hear somebody's voice, um, you can hear the humanity in that individual, right? So if I was having a conflict scenario with you, a conflict interview with you, and I, was, and I said to you, I said, just tell me what's going on. Like, there's obviously a lot of frustration here. I'd like to hear your side of the story. Um, and as they start sharing this, all you got to do is listen and take tons and tons of notes, write everything down that they're saying, okay? And what you've got to expect in this situation, there's almost certainly gonna be a lot of emotion. There's gonna be a lot of ranting. There's gonna be a lot of exaggerating. There's gonna be a lot of complaining, bickering, carping, and moaning, okay? As they get all of this stuff off their chest, okay? And don't challenge them. Just let, just, uh, uh, just let them get it, up, get it out. Write everything down. And what you're looking for as you go through this is you want to identify the root causes. You want to figure out out of all of that noise and bluster 
and complaining and accusations, what are the one or two things that are causing a problem there, right? So if I go back to my example of um, me being upset about the guitarist in my metal band not saying thank you, let's say I have a big moaning session. They're like, oh, I'm sick and tired of this, this, and you, ne you never appreciate this, that, and the other, okay? The root cause of that I would argue, would be me feeling underappreciated. It's not really about the fact that he didn't say thank you after I dropped him off at band practice. Uh, um, it's that he didn't appreciate my role in the band. That's the root cause, right? So from that root cause, we can then, um, we can then start thinking about what solutions are going to be. And these solutions have got to be practical solutions. So when you go through this process, you get on a call with the individuals, you let them get everything off their chest, you take a bunch of notes and start identifying some root causes. And then what you want to do is you want to get back on a call with, all, with everybody together. And what you do is you say, look, I know this has been some things have gone down here. My role, as you both know, is I'm here as a facilitator. And what I want to do is I want to share with you some of the things that I've explored and I've identified. And I've got some ideas for some, some, some solutions that I'd like us to try. Okay. And what you do is you share those root causes, right? Now, in almost all of these situations, those root causes, people will privately agree with them, but they may not publicly agree with them, you know? To give the example of not feeling appreciated, that's something that people would probably feel, feel comfortable publicly agreeing with. But um, saying that somebody else, saying that there's insecurity in members of the team is something that people might not be comfortable in, 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 in sharing. So you don't need to get them to agree to the root cause. What you need to get them to agree to is the solutions. That's what we care about. And the idea here is that the practical solutions are super easy, low hanging fruit, you know? So let's use another example. Let's assume for, for a second that um, there's a conflict between two different developers in a project and, um, and they're both accusing the other person of intentionally complaining and getting in the way of the project, right? Now, what you do is you talk to each of them and you identify that the root cause here is that they both have different expectations about what this project is supposed to be, right? So when you get them back together on, a, on the phone, and again, it has to be on a video call, an audio call, something where you can hear, or hear and or see somebody, um, you say, I think one of the root causes here is that both of you have got very different ideas for what this project should be, okay? And what I'd like to suggest we do as a practical solution is that we schedule a call and let's just talk through those ideas. And what I wanna do is get both of you on a call and before you get to that call, to show up with three things that you feel like this project should be, right? Three areas where you wanna focus this project on. And then what you do in that call is you review their three suggestions and you identify, okay, well, how can we take some bits from this bit and some bits from this bit and kind of bring them together. And that's how we get to the solution. All right, make sense? Yep. And then the final thing we do here is to document this and to maintain it, right? So essentially what we're doing is here is we're gonna say, okay, well, we've identified these root causes. We've all agreed we're gonna work on these um, three solutions, three little things that we're gonna do. You write them down in an email and you send it to everybody involved, right? And then what you do is you say, let's catch back up in a couple of weeks and see how we're doing. And the goal here is to get everybody to agree to the things that you've documented. Now, once you get to the steps four and five in this process, the heat will be significantly dissipated from a conflict scenario in 98% of cases, okay? Now, you may be thinking, all right, what happens, Jono, if people are just unwilling to participate, if people are unwilling to go through this process? Well, this is when you're gonna to have to sit down with them as the facilitator and hopefully, again, from a position of a trusted individual and say, look, the only way in which we're gonna re rectify this is if we all play a role in finding a solution to it. I can't help you if you're not willing to play a role in finding a solution. And if they say, I'm not interested in finding a role, uh, in, 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 I'm not interested in playing a role to find a solution, then sadly those people have gotta go. Like you can't have those people in your community because they will be actively toxic, okay? The good news is that I've experienced that literally a handful of times in my entire career. In over 20 years of doing this, that's only happened a couple of times. All right, so let's now move on to our third layer of the pyramid. 
And again, if you've got any questions, get them into the chat. I'd love to hear them. I'd love to go and respond to them. You know, my goal here is to, uh, is, is, is that you can take as much of this away and apply um, this in the, in the future. You know, my hope is that this session is gonna be something that's in your back pocket that you can use when you have to deal with these kinds of situations. So this third layer is, for me, is the one that definitely has the most amount of impact. Um, and it's definitely the one that is the most dangerous frankly, and that is stress and burnout. Now, many years ago, I burnt out. I'd been, I'd been working at Canonical for about, um, about a year. Um, and you know, the Ubuntu community was just exploding, right? There was just, in a good way, there was so much interesting excitement around Ubuntu. Um, and I was just constantly on the road. I was single at the time. I was flying around the world. Um, going to conferences and speaking at events and meeting people. And it was, it was an absolute blast. You know, one week I'd be having Caprines with, uh, with my friends in Brazil. And the next moment I'd be in Spain, you know, going out for tapas, right? It was, it was awesome. Um, but I, was, I found myself getting a little agitated and just generally being quite grumpy. Um, and um, a guy who worked on my team called Daniel Holbach, who uh, who will be a, a lifelong friend of mine, s just said to me one day, I was like, are you okay? Because you've, you've been really grouchy recently. Like, really grouchy. <laughs> and I was really happy that he said this. Like, a lot of people wouldn't feel comfortable going to their, their boss about this. But I had a very, very kind of a loose-knit team. And that's when I realized, you know what? Yeah, something's going on here. So I realized that I was burning out. Um, I'd heard about this thing called burnout, but I really didn't know a lot about it. So what I did is I went online and I, and I, and I, I did some research and I found this article in this magazine called Scientific American Mind on burnout. And it talked through the 12 stages of burnout. Um, it was this, um, this wonderful study that was done that identified these 12 stages. And you start out at stage one, which is being a bit grumpy. And stage 12 is, is you know, basically suicide in many cases, sadly. Um, so what I want to do is I want to go through, I've summarized these stages of burnout and I'm going to, and I'm going to share them with you uh, because it's useful to know what they are. I'm not going to go through all 12 stages. I've, I've kind of condensed them down into, into a, a smaller set of stages so we can get through them. Um, now, one of the things that you need to know as we go through this is not everybody will experience all of these different stages. And sometimes these stages happen in a different order, okay? Um, and what I'd like you to do is as we're going through this, I'd like you to think about which stage you have been at or you, that you might be at right now. If you feel comfortable, share that in the chat. Um, if you don't feel comfortable, you do not have to share anything. Okay. This is a very, very personal topic. Totally understand if you don't want to share anything. Okay. Um, but I want to go through this so you can recognize when burnout's happening in yourself, but also when you can recognize it in your fellow community members in your fellow colleagues, in your fellow family members and friends and loved ones, all right? Okay, so let's go through these stages. So again, if you feel comfortable sharing which stage you've been at in the past or which stage you're at right now, feel able to pop it in the chat, but don't feel like you have to. Stage one is around insecurity and proof. So typically what happens at stage one is, is that we are, we're feeling tense, right? Something's going on and um, we are, um, we just know something's not quite right. You just don't really feel yourself. And what typically starts happening is you start feeling a little insecure about yourself, um, especially with your work. Now I had this when I was at Canonical and I was burning out. I was like, God, I feel like I'm just not really as good as everybody seems to think I am. Um, you know, I was getting a lot of attention back then in my, in my career. And I was having just rocking imposter syndrome, which if you're unfamiliar with imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome, the basic idea of it is, um, is that uh, people really respect you for what you do, but you think you're actually not very good. And it's only a matter of time before you get found out. Okay, a lot of period, people experience this in all walks of life. It's especially common with um, underrepresented groups. All right, now, Insecurity and proof, all right? So you start feeling a bit insecure and you feel like you need to prove yourself, right? So you start working more. You start checking your phone on weekends more. 
you start responding to your email more, uh, you start cramming on some of the things that you feel like you need to know about that you don't know about. So you can feel like you're able to kind of um, deal with that, all right? So that's stage one. Stage two is that you just start working harder and working longer, right? So you, you, you finish work later. Um, you, again, you kind of, it, your work bleeds into the weekends, uh, bleeds into your evenings. You start taking some time away from your family um, um, or your friends or your hobbies or your interests and replacing it with work. And it's all with this kind of desire to try and prove yourself and to deal with that sense of insecurity that it's only a matter of time before this house of cards that is my career starts, starts falling down and crumbling, okay? Now, because you're working harder and longer, um, and in many cases, you're not actually doing better work, you just longer work, right? Um, you start getting tired. And that's when stress starts, you know, it's, here's the thing, and I know it's difficult to say this at a tech event, it is not healthy for us to be in front of computers and screens as much as we are. Like, we all know this, but we, we do it anyway, right? Because screens are really fun, computers are really fun. But it's not healthy for us, right? And it's really not healthy to lay in bed at night and look at your, your phone, okay? If you're gonna look at a screen before you go to bed, everybody, buy a Kindle. It's much, much better for your sleep. I've literally measured this. I have a mattress that tracks how well I sleep and I, I track it with my watch and everything. It's, it's the, the impact of screens is not good on your sleep. But, um, you know, we spend time, if we spend loads more time on our computers and we're constantly zoning in our work, we're not spending time, uh, you know, relaxing and um, engaging in our hobbies, which helps us to, to relieve our stress. Stress is gonna start growing more and more and more. Like for me, Stress relief is my family and stress relief, it, stress relief for me is my family, it is my music, and it is drinking gin, okay? Those are the things that help me to relieve my stress, okay? You don't have to drink gin, okay? I do, because I think it's tasty. All right, step three, or stage three in the burnout cycle is that then you stop taking care of yourself. You start drinking too much gin. Um, you start eating fast food, and junk food because you don't have time or the energy to cook. You stop exercising as much, okay? And again, one thing that, to be very clear, exercise is an unbelievable medicine for um, anxiety and, and burnout. Um, when I first moved to the US 13 years ago, I never exercised ever. Uh, my wife, who's, uh, who's a health nut, has got me into exercising every week. And if I don't exercise for a couple of weeks, I start getting stressed. So um, you stop, you, you know, stage three, you stop taking care of yourself, okay? Um, so this is when things are starting to get somewhat serious. And that, this is usually when people feel really worn out. I actually experienced this a little while, a little bit about, about what, three months ago? Um, and I took a fairly extreme approach and I fired half my clients just so I could ease up my life. Now I have, I'm very fortunate, I have a lot of, because I run my own business, I can do that. But if you're working for another company, it's, it's harder to do that. But just find ways in which you can start taking care of yourself a little bit more. Now, things are gonna get a little, uh, little morbid as we kind of proceed through this, okay? So here's a picture of my dog posing to kind of relieve the tension a little bit. Okay, this is Biscuit, Biscuit the Wonder Dog. He's a ridiculous hound. Uh, okay, Biscuit, everyone, everyone, Biscuit. All right, so let's move on to stage four. This is relief and rejection. So just to recap at this point, you feel a bit insecure, like stage one, you uh, feel a bit insecure about how good you are and you know, whether you're gonna be found out as actually not being very good, which is imposter syndrome. So you start trying to prove yourself more and more. You start working longer hours, working harder, spending less time with your family, friends, hobbies. You stop taking care of yourself as much because uh, you're, you're, you're tired. You don't exercise, you eat junk food, you drink too much alcohol, maybe you in, in, indulge in drugs, whatever. That kind of stuff, not good. Stage four is when serious burnout is setting in. Luckily, most people don't get to this stage, okay? And this is where you just need to find a means to get relief. You're so worn out, you're so tired, you're so sick of be, being scared and ang anxious that you just need relief. And this is sadly when a lot of people will uh, well, some people rather will, 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 will indulge in drugs, alcohol. There's been reports in the study um, that I read in that magazine, in, in American Scientific Mind magazine, that uh, kind of unusual sexual practices can sometimes manifest at this stage um, in the burnout cycle. 
And sadly, what often happens here is that uh, when people start expressing concerns and worry about you, you reject them, right? I'm just going through a difficult time right now, right? It's not me, I'm not the problem. It's these idiots that I work with. Nobody understands me. Nobody's seeing the world for what it really is. People are living in la-la land, right? This is the kind of stuff that people will say when they're going through this stage, okay? Um, if you've experienced this in the past or if you're, experiencing in, if you're experiencing this right now, this is the time, and I'm being serious here, to go and get some help. Go talk to your doctor, go talk to a therapist, because this is a serious level of burnout and you definitely wanna be able to, to deal with it. The good news is that most of the time people can, can get through this, they can deal with it. There's lots of things we can do to rectify this, but just knowing that there's a problem is important. Then what we do is we move on to the fifth and final stage, uh, and this is withdrawal and depression. This is obviously the most, most serious part of this, okay? And this is typically when people are so worn out that their mental health is really significantly disrupted by this. They withdraw from people, they stop seeing their friends, they stop seeing their family members. This is sadly, this is when real issues can be caused with, with people's uh, relationships with their spouses. Um, um, and real depression starts uh, setting in, right? I mean, and this whole burnout cycle is gonna be difficult enough if you already suffer from depression, uh, but this is when significant levels of depression can kind of manifest. And sadly, this is when in, in it's luckily in, 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 in a relatively small number of cases, but in some cases, um, this is when people can experience suicidal thoughts and, and, and those kinds of things. So this is obviously a very serious situation. You definitely wanna go and seek a medical professional. So as a general rule, I would recommend when you're in stages one and two, just try to, try to take a step back, um, try to um, not worry as much. Maybe some meditation, some mindfulness is good. When you start getting to stage three, um, definitely I would recommend going and speaking to a, a doctor or a therapist. There's no, uh, there's no shame in talking to a doctor or a therapist about this. And definitely if you're in stages four and five, definitely seek medical help um, um, because it's a serious situation and you, you, know, you wanna make sure that you can, you've got the tools that, to, to, to deal with it, all right? I wish I had that picture of my dog because it's, you know, it's very serious stuff, okay? Now, um, the solution to this is, is to go to, when you see it in other people, right? It could be team members or your colleagues or your friends or your family. One of the things you should do is just go up to them and just say, hey, I got your back. I'm here to help, okay? And to help walk them through these problems. The challenge is that, you know, when we get into this, when you get into the um, kind of the, uh, the rejection phase, stage four and five, sometimes people can reject help. So when you start seeing people burning out, that's definitely the time when, when you should go and say, I've got your back. Let me try and help you out. Maybe you should take a breather, checking in on them. You know, these kinds of things can be very, very helpful, okay? You wanna try and help them as much as you can before they start rejecting people. Um, but then something you might wanna consider for yourself is what I call a stoic toolbox, all right? Um, there's some amazing books out there that I would recommend you read um, if you are either burning out right now or if you, uh, you wanna prevent yourself from burning out in the future. If you are burning out right now, the book you should go and buy is called The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. It's a wonderful book. I was burning out uh, at one point. I read this book, it really helped. I have a stack of them in my office and I give them to people when they are struggling. You know, a friend of mine had breast cancer. She'd just been diagnosed, I gave her a book. Uh, another friend of mine got let go from his job um, due to COVID, gave him a book. You know, so this is a really great book. I'd also recommend The Daily Stoic. Stoicism is this really interesting kind of psychology um, or philosophy rather. Uh, which is all about kind of building resilience in yourself. It's like training a little voice in your brain that is able to, um, uh, that is able to um, just help to get you through situations in a very productive manner. You know, imagine for example, you're, 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 you, you get called in for a meeting with your boss and your boss is unhappy about something and they start telling you how all of this work that you've done is wrong. And maybe they're not handling it very well and they're kind of being a, a bit mean about things. A lot of people in those situations, they snap and they react and then they go home and they think, oh, why did I say that? Why did it react in that way? What stoicism would teach you is to train a little voice in the back of your head to say, okay, this is suboptimal. This is a uncomfortable situation, but what do I wanna learn? 
And what decision do I want to make that will be the best outcome at this moment in time? That's kind of what Stoicism teaches us. It's really hard, but it's incredibly worthwhile. Another book I'd recommend is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. When I first heard the title of this book, I snorted in disgust at the title. I thought it was so stupid, like one of these cheesy self-help books. But it is one of the most incredible books I've ever read. I definitely go recommend you go and check it out by uh, Stephen R. Covey. All right. All righty, my friends. I hope that was useful um, just to kind of cap this off. Um, you know, I love sharing uh, things that I've learned. Uh, if you go to John, www.johnabacon.com forward slash pack um, and you pop in your first name and email address, you can, um, you can sign up and I'll, I'll send you tons of really useful stuff. I'll send you a couple of free uh, chapters from my book, People Powered, which is a bestseller. It's uh, won a business book award. It's been doing really well. I'll send you some audiobook chapters. I also like to send people out templates and cheat sheets for how to build communities. Uh, tips and best practices. I send free training. I do mentoring sweepstakes where I get on one-on-one -on -one sessions with people. So anyway, so I hope that might be uh, useful. Feel free to go over there and I'll keep you posted. I don't, I don't spam people with sales stuff and, you know, I don't, I, I don't share your information with other people. You know, people who suck do that. They should be in the triangle of suck. Anyway, thank you so much again for joining. I hope you have a wonderful week and weekend. Um, thank you to my good friends in the LCA organize, organizational team. They do such, such a wonderful job with this event and definitely go and, uh, and give them your thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hello. Hopefully I'm back here on camera now. Um, I don't suppose we've got Jono around. All right. <laughs> Well done. That was really interesting. I, I, I thought um, when you hit the burnout stuff, the, everyone in the chat's going, oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> it is weird. I remember the first time I ever talked about burnout um, was actually at a canonical all hands. Um, and uh, just I walked through the 12 stages of burnout and I had one of my colleagues come up to me um, and said that they were at one of the later stages. And then um, I found out without making this too morbid, I found out that they were actively you know having suicidal thoughts they went to see a therapist and you know just their life became a lot happier because they knew they, they could they could kind of distinguish where they were in the cycle and they knew that there was a way around it so um it's so valuable and not enough people know about that stuff so yeah did um i wasn't there in the chat the whole time were there any sort of big points you thought worth worthwhile talking about yeah i mean one of the things towards the end actually was uh uh the books like there's a, a, a few people saying you know i struggle with these kinds of books um and i have a similar kind of issue with you know these books about self-help and things like that often because they're written by uh, nauseating individuals um and sometimes they're too fluffy in general um yeah. but i'm a big fan of anything that provides really practical guidelines to do in these things um and the thing that i've learned is you just have to practice right like stoicism is a good example i touched on that towards the end it is a really, really powerful philosophy for how you can evaluate the world in a really objective way. The problem with Stoicism is that when you go down that rabbit hole, um, all anyone talks about is Marcus Aurelius and like these Roman emperors and and it kind of gets a little weird. Um, so, but I would definitely encourage people uh, to check into that. Um, and then there was just also some comments in the chat about, um, you know how to the, the conflict resolution part seemed to like spin up a lot of discussion which i thought was interesting um in how people kind of approach that manage that um and you know especially when people aren't seeing eye to eye when people aren't even willing to get on the same page so yeah yeah all right well um thanks very much that was really interesting i think it, you've really hit pretty much everybody in the in the chat room with um a big, you know, nerd sniping arrow. And here is your um, live illustration. We'll hopefully give you a, a hard copy of this when it's all complete. Cool. Yeah. That's cool. Oh, by the way, there's one other thing which I need to outline. I mentioned Triangle of Suck in my session, which I made up when I was recording it. Somebody went and registered the domain at <laughs> LCA, which is awesome. So whoever, whoever that perfect human being is, thank you for doing that. <laughs> Ah, oh, good show. All right, so um, we are now coming up to the first break of the day. Um, I'd like to <clears throat> ask all our attendees um, to remember that the main sessions start at 10.45, so we're back into the, the full conference now. 
Uh, and then there's the Linux AGM at lunchtime and the PDNS session with Anthony Green at 6.30 tonight. So please go have fun and we'll see you a bit later on. Thanks everyone.